This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Orthodoxy by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 8 The Romance of Orthodoxy. Part 1. It is customary to complain of the bustle and strenuousness of our epoch, but in truth the chief mark of our epoch is a profound laziness and fatigue, and the fact is that the real laziness is the cause of the apparent bustle. Take one quite external case. The streets are noisy with taxicabs and motor-cars, but this is not due to human activity, but to human repose. There would be less bustle if there were more activity, if people were simply walking about. The world would be more silent if it were more strenuous. And this, which is true of the apparent physical bustle, is true also of the apparent bustle of the intellect. Most of the machinery of modern language is labor-saving machinery, and it saves mental labor very much more than it ought. Scientific phrases are used like scientific wheels and piston rods to make swifter and smoother yet the path of the comfortable. Long words go rattling by us like long railway trains. We know they are carrying thousands who are too tired or too indolent to walk and think for themselves. It is a good exercise to try for once in a way to express any opinion one holds in words of one syllable. If you say, the social utility of the indeterminate sentence is recognized by all criminologists as a part of our sociological evolution toward a more humane and scientific view of punishment, you can go on talking like that for hours with hardly a movement of the gray matter inside your skull. But if you begin, I wish Jones to go to Gale and Brown to say when Jones shall come out, you will discover with a thrill of horror that you are obliged to think. The long words are not the hard words, it is the short words that are hard. There is much more metaphysical subtlety in the word damn than in the word degeneration. But these long comfortable words which save modern people the toil of reasoning have one particular aspect in which they are especially ruinous and confusing. This difficulty occurs when the same long word is used in different connections to mean quite different things. Thus, to take a well-known instance, the word idealist has one meaning as a piece of philosophy and quite another as a piece of moral rhetoric. In the same way, the scientific materialists have had just reason to complain of people mixing up materialist as a term of cosmology with materialist as a moral taunt. So, to take a cheaper instance, the man who hates progressives in London always calls himself a progressive in South Africa. A confusion quite as unmeaning as this has arisen in connection with the word liberal, as applied to religion, and as applied to politics and society. It is often suggested that all liberals ought to be free thinkers, because they ought to love everything that is free. You might just as well say that all idealists ought to be high churchmen, because they ought to love everything that is high. You might just as well say that low churchmen ought to like low mass, or the broad churchmen ought to like broad jokes. The thing is a mere accident of words. In actual modern Europe, a free thinker does not mean a man who thinks for himself. It means a man who, having thought for himself, has come to one particular class of conclusions, the material order of phenomena, the impossibility of miracles, the improbability of personal immortality, and so on. And none of these ideas are particularly liberal. Nay, indeed, almost all these ideas are definitely illiberal, as it is the purpose of this chapter to show. In the few following pages, I propose to point out as rapidly as possible that on every single one of the matters most strongly insisted on by liberalizers of theology, their effect on social practice would be definitely illiberal. Almost every contemporary proposal to bring freedom into the church is simply a proposal to bring tyranny into the world. For freeing the church now does not even mean freeing it in all directions. It means freeing that peculiar set of dogmas loosely called scientific, dogmas of monism, of pantheism, or of Arianism, or of necessity. And every one of these, and we will take them one by one, can be shown to be the natural ally of oppression. In fact, it is a remarkable circumstance, indeed not so very remarkable when one comes to think of it, that most things are the allies of oppression. There is only one thing that can never go past a certain point in its alliance with oppression, and that is orthodoxy. I may, it is true, twist orthodoxy so as partly to justify a tyrant, but I can easily make up a German philosophy to justify him entirely. Now let us take in order the innovations that are the notes of the new theology or the modernist church. 
We concluded the last chapter with the discovery of one of them. The very doctrine which is called the most old-fashioned was found to be the only safeguard of the new democracies of the earth. The doctrine seemingly most unpopular was found to be the only strength of the people. In short, we found that the only logical negation of oligarchy was in the affirmation of original sin. So it is, I maintain, in all the other cases. I take the most obvious instance first, the case of miracles. For some extraordinary reason, there is a fixed notion that it is more liberal to disbelieve in miracles than to believe in them. Why, I cannot imagine, nor can anyone else tell me. For some inconceivable cause, a broad or liberal clergyman always means a man who wishes at least to diminish the number of miracles. It never means a man who wishes to increase their number. It always means a man who is free to disbelieve that Christ came out of his grave. It never means a man who is free to believe that his own aunt came out of her grave. It is common to find trouble in a parish because the parish priest cannot admit that St. Peter walked on water. Yet how rarely do we find trouble in a parish because the clergyman says that his father walked on the serpentine. And this is not because, as the swift secularist debater would immediately retort, miracles cannot be believed in our experience. It is not because miracles do not happen, as in the dogma which Matthew Arnold recited with simple faith, more supernatural things are alleged to have happened in our time than would have been possible eighty years ago. Men of science believe in such marvels much more than they did. The most perplexing and even horrible prodigies of mind and spirit are always being unveiled in modern psychology. Things that the old science at least would frankly have rejected as miracles are hourly being asserted by the new science. The only thing which is still old-fashioned enough to reject miracles is the new theology. But in truth, this notion that it is free to deny miracles has nothing to do with the evidence for or against them. It is a lifeless verbal prejudice, of which the original life and beginning was not in the freedom of thought, but simply in the dogma of materialism. The man of the nineteenth century did not disbelieve in the resurrection because his liberal Christianity allowed him to doubt it. He disbelieved in it because his very strict materialism did not allow him to believe it. Tennyson, a very typical nineteenth-century man, uttered one of the instinctive truisms of his contemporaries when he said that there was faith in their honest doubt. There was indeed. Those words have a profound and even a horrible truth. In their doubt of miracles there was a faith in a fixed and godless fate, a deep and sincere faith in the incurable routine of the cosmos. The doubts of the agnostic were only the dogmas of the monist. On the fact and evidence of the supernatural I will speak afterwards. Here we are only concerned with this clear point, that in so far as the liberal idea of freedom can be said to be on either side of the discussion about miracles, it is obviously on the side of miracles. Reform, or in the only tolerable sense, progress, means simply the gradual control of matter by mind. A miracle simply means the swift control of matter by mind. If you wish to feed the people, you may think that feeding them miraculously in the wilderness is impossible, but you cannot think it illiberal. If you really want poor children to go to the seaside, you cannot think it illiberal that they should go there on flying dragons. You can only think it unlikely. A holiday, like liberalism, only means the liberty of man. A miracle only means the liberty of God. You may conscientiously deny either of them, but you cannot call your denial a triumph of the liberal idea. The Catholic Church believed that man and God both had a sort of spiritual freedom. Calvinism took away the freedom from man, but left it to God. Scientific materialism binds the Creator Himself. It chains up God as the apocalypse chained the devil. It leaves nothing free in the universe. And those who assist this process are called the liberal theologians. This, I say, is the lightest and most evident case. The assumption that there is something in the doubt of miracles akin to liberality or reform is literally the opposite of the truth. If a man cannot believe in miracles, there is an end of the matter. He is not particularly liberal, but he is perfectly honorable and logical, which are much better things. But if he can believe in miracles, he is certainly the more liberal for doing so, because they mean first the freedom of the soul, and secondly its control over the tyranny of circumstance. Sometimes this truth is ignored in a singularly naive way, even by the ablest men. For instance, Mr. Bernard Shaw speaks with hearty old-fashioned contempt for the idea of miracles, as if they were a sort of breach of faith on the part of nature. He seems strangely unconscious that miracles are only the final flowers of his own favorite tree, the doctrine of the omnipotence of will. Just in the same way he calls the desire for immortality a paltry selfishness, forgetting that he has just called the desire for life a healthy and heroic selfishness. 
how can it be noble to wish to make one's life infinite and yet mean to wish to make it immortal no if it is desirable that man should triumph over the cruelty of nature or custom then miracles are certainly desirable we will discuss afterwards whether they are possible but i must pass on to the larger cases of this curious error the notion that the liberalizing of religion in some way helps the liberation of the world the second example of it can be found in the question of pantheism or rather of a certain modern attitude which is often called eminentism and which often is buddhism but this is so much more difficult a matter that i must approach it with rather more preparation the things said most confidently by advanced persons to crowded audiences are generally those quite opposite to the fact it is actually our truisms that are untrue here is a case there is a phrase of facile liberality uttered again and again at ethical societies and parliaments of religion the religions of the earth differ in rites and forms but they are the same in what they teach it is false it is the opposite of the fact the religions of the earth do not greatly differ in rites and forms they do greatly differ in what they teach it is as if a man were to say do not be misled by the fact that the church times and the free thinker look utterly different that one is painted on vellum and the other carved on marble that one is triangular and the other hectagonal read them and you will see that they say the same thing the truth is of course that they are all alike in everything except in the fact that they don't say the same thing an atheist stockbroker in surbiton looks exactly like a swedborgian stockbroker in wimbledon you may walk round and round them and subject them to the most personal and offensive study without seeing anything swedborgian in the hat or anything particularly godless in the umbrella it is exactly in their souls that they are divided so the truth is that the difficulty of all the creeds of earth is not as alleged in this cheap maxim that they agree in meaning but differ in machinery it is exactly the opposite they agree in machinery almost every great religion on earth works with the same external methods with priests scriptures altars sworn brotherhoods special feasts they agree in the mode of teaching what they differ about is the thing to be taught pagan optimists and eastern pessimists would both have temples just as liberals and tories would both have newspapers creeds that exist to destroy each other both have scriptures just as armies that exist to destroy each other both have guns the great example of this alleged identity of all human religions is the alleged spiritual identity of buddhism and christianity those who adopt this theory generally avoid the ethics of most other creeds except indeed confucianism which they like because it is not a creed but they are cautious in their praises of mohammedanism generally confining themselves to imposing its morality only upon the refreshment of the lower classes they seldom suggest the mohammedan way of marriage for which there is a great deal to be said and toward the thugs and fetish worshippers their attitude may even be cold but in the case of the great religion of guatama they feel sincerely a similarity students of popular science like mr blatchford are always insisting that christianity and buddhism are very much alike especially buddhism this is generally believed and i believed it myself until i read a book giving the reasons for it the reasons were of two kinds resemblances that meant nothing because they were common to all humanity and resemblances which were not resemblances at all the author solemnly explained that the two creeds were alike in things in which all creeds are alike or else he described them as alike in some point in which they are quite obviously different thus as a case of the first class he said that both christ and buddha were called by the divine voice coming out of the sky as if you would expect the divine voice to come out of the coal cellar or again it was gravely urged that these two eastern teachers by a singular coincidence had to do with the washing of feet you might as well say that it was a remarkable coincidence that they both had feet to wash and the other class of similarities were those which simply were not similar thus this reconciler of the two religions draws earnest attention to the fact that at certain religious feasts the robe of the lama is rent in pieces out of respect and the remnants highly valued but this is the reverse of a resemblance for the garments of christ were not rent in pieces out of respect but out of derision and the remnants were not highly valued except for what they would fetch in the rag shop it is rather like alluding to the obvious connection between the two ceremonies of the sword when it taps a man's shoulder and when it cuts off his head it is not at all similar for the man these scraps of puerile pedantry would indeed matter little if it were not also true that the alleged philosophical resemblances are also of these two kind either proving too much or not proving anything that buddhism approves of mercy or of self-restraint is not to say that it is specially like christianity it is only to say that it is not utterly unlike all human existence 
Buddhists disapprove in theory of cruelty or excess because all sane human beings disapprove in theory of cruelty or excess. But to say that Buddhism and Christianity give the same philosophy of these things is simply false. All humanity does agree that we are in a net of sin. Most of humanity agrees that there is some way out. But as to what is the way out, I do not think that there are two institutions in the universe which contradict each other so flatly as Buddhism and Christianity. Even when I thought, with most other well-informed though unscholarly people, that Buddhism and Christianity were alike, there was one thing about them that always perplexed me. I mean, the startling difference in their types of religious art. I do not mean in its technical style of representation, but in the things that it was manifestly meant to represent. No two ideals could be more opposite than a Christian saint in a Gothic cathedral and a Buddhist saint in a Chinese temple. The opposition exists at every point, but perhaps the shortest statement of it is that the Buddhist saint always has his eyes shut, while the Christian saint always has his very wide open. The Buddhist saint has a sleek and harmonious body, but his eyes are heavy and sealed with sleep. The medieval saint's body is wasted to its crazy bones, but his eyes are frightfully alive. There cannot be any real community of spirit between forces that produce symbols so different as that. Granted that both images are extravagances, are perversions of the pure creed, it must be a real divergence which could produce such opposite extravagances. The Buddhist is looking with a peculiar intentness inwards. The Christian is staring with a frantic intentness outwards. If we follow that clue steadily, we shall find some interesting things. End of chapter 8 Part 1